Hey, History Through Film. Welcome to U3L27, Intro to the Other Side of War. So, um, when I was planning out this class, I was like, whoa, this is like our last lecture video of this class. Isn't that crazy to think? So, we still have Unit 4 to go. Um, that one will watch Hidden Figures. Um, but I don't have any, like, lecture -y videos like I do with Unit 3. Um... So yeah, kind of crazy. This is the, like the last one I'll make that you guys got to watch. As far as I know, maybe things will change. Not sure. Anyway, um, this there's a lot of information on the slideshow. Okay, I'm sorry this video is a little bit longer than most. Um, but when we talk about World War II, I mean, there's just a lot to talk about. So let's get started. So, learning targets. Describe the social, political, and economic causes and main turning points in World War II. Identify major developments in science, medicine, and technology. And analyze their benefits and danger. Um, so, with that one today, we'll talk about like the atomic bomb. It's very interesting. Uh, so, you're going to watch this Ed Puzzle video as you watch um, the questions that I ask you in blue text. I just want you to answer on the Ed Puzzle. Um, the questions that are in pink text, those are the ones that I want you to answer on your study guide. Okay. All right. So here's a map of Japan, uh, which is where in this corner of the world, our next video that we're watching is located entirely in Japan. Um, they live close to a little city in Hiroshima. Um, so Hiroshima is right here in Japan. Uh, here's Nagasaki. That one's also to know um, and then Tokyo is kind of up here a little bit more in like the center of Japan um, and then you can see it goes all the way up to the island of Hokkaido. Uh, you can also see it's incredibly close to Russia as well as the Koreas and a little bit into China as well. We'll see lots of maps today. So first question for you just answer this on the Ed Puzzle. What do you know about Japan's involvement in World War II? You don't have to tell me everything just like one to three people of information is fine. Okay, so, right, there were two sides to World War II. You had the Axis powers and you had the Ally powers. So the Axis powers included Japan, Italy, Germany. The Allies included France, the United States, woo, that's us, uh, Britain, and the Soviet Union. Okay, those are the two sides. Uh, so Japan, before World War II, they were in a crazy economic depression from 1929 all the way through the 1930s, just like the United States was during this time as well. Um, they wanted to expand industrialization, but in order to expand industrialization, you need resources. Um, so Japan has very, very few resources, like natural resources. They're pretty much like a giant volcanic rock island. Um, so they're like, hey, to get those resources, we're going to invade China as well as French Indochina. If you don't know what French Indochina is, um, it's here south of China. It includes countries like Laos and Vietnam. Um, so... That's what Japan did. They invaded China and French Indochina. And after 1929, Japan's military wanted to take over even more land in Asia. So in 1931, Japan seizes Manchuria, uh, which you can see on the map is right here. So that's a pretty big chunk of China. Um, they wanted Manchuria because it had a lot of raw materials, specifically oil. Um, and Japan wants an empire just like Western countries. So we're talking like France, uh, Great Britain, Germany. They want to kind of get in on colonizing different parts of the world to exploit different countries for resources. Um, so they use something called the Mukden incident as a justification to invade Manchuria. Right, so when you invade a foreign country, you typically need a reason for doing that. So the Japan invents one, and I'll talk about that right now. Um, so when we talk about the Mukden incident, um, so here is a map of the railroad system in China. Um, so you can see here's Mukden right here. Uh, you can see the railroad kind of comes from here in the south, a little bit north. There's a little bit up here in Manchuria as well. Um, and then you can see that it's pretty close to Japan. 
So this Mukaden incident happened in September 19th of 1931. So this piece of railroad that I just showed you in the map before, it was owned by the Japanese, okay? So it's a Japanese railroad in China, okay? And Japan's like, hey, we need a reason to invade China. So they're like, whoa, I have a great idea. What we're going to do is we're going to dress up like Chinese people. We're going to blow up this railroad of ours and blame it on the Chinese. And that is how they're going to invade China. And that's exactly what they did. So they disguised themselves as Chinese. They blew up their own railroad. They're like, ah. Oh, China, how dare you? I'm going to invade you now. And that's what they did. So they took Manchuria, that landmass that I showed you, as their own. Huh, yeah, fun times. All right, so um, Japan. Uh, during this time, there's something called the League of Nations. If you don't know what the League of Nations are, um, it was kind of like... It's kind of like the United Nations today, where there's a bunch of countries that work together. Um, so the League of Nations were formed after World War I. It was meant to unite countries so there wouldn't be any more wars. Um, the U.S. was the main um, like voice in making the League of Nations. Um, but once the president wanted to join, <laughs> Congress was like, no, you can't join. Uh, so it really fell apart pretty quick. Um, so again, it's it's really similar to like today's United Nations, but it was a lot more dysfunctional. So anyway, so this League of Nations, they condemn Japan for taking Manchuria. They're like, oh, poo-poo on you, Japan, but then they don't do anything about it. Um, and Japan's like, wait a minute, I want to still continue and I want to expand even farther into China. Um, so Japan leaves the League of Nations. So question number one, write this on your study guide. What did the League of Nations do in response to Japan invading China? All right, let's talk a little bit more about Japan and their invasions. So, um, Japan invaded China between 1931 and 1945. Uh, the leader of China at this time, um, his name was Chiang Kai-shek. Um, and he was the former leader of the Chinese Communist Party, um, which if you know anything about politics today, today China is communist. Um, and China became communist like in about 1911. Uh, they didn't want to get involved with Japan. They're kind of struggling with their own power. Um, Japan had different ideas. So Chiang Kai shek tried to make peace with japan and he's like hey japan if you i give you northern china will you leave us alone and japan was like mm, no i want more than that um so japan moved south in chiang and his communist chinese army fought japan um and this is what started the sino japanese war um, so here is a map of the Empire of Japan. This is in 1942, so this is like right when the United States entered World War II. Um, so you can see that Japan, of course, has Japan all the way up here into northern China, so like Manchuria, um, here onto the coast of China, all of French Indochina, and then into the Dutch East Indies. Um, and they're really close to even approaching Australia. So this is a huge amount of land that Japan is now controlling. So, like I said, China versus Japan is known as the Sino-Japanese War. Um, it starts in 1937. It goes all the way to 1945, uh, which is the end of World War II. Uh, so Japan takes Beijing, Tianjin, and Shanghai. Um, and it also stations its navy on the entire eastern Chinese coast. Um, so that blocks China from trading with other countries. So Japan has entire monopoly on Chinese exports. So nothing comes in or out of China without Japan knowing. Uh, so Europe, they're like, Japan, how dare you? Poo-poo on you. But then they don't do anything about it. Uh, so they just let Japan take over all of like 
China and French Indochina and all these other countries. Uh, so to slow the Japanese, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, remember he's the leader of the Communist Party, he blows up a dam on the Yellow River. If you don't know what the Yellow River is, it is this like giant major river in China. It's like the equivalent of our like Mississippi River. Um, it works kind of. Uh, so the Yellow River floods. Um, yes, it does slow down the Japanese army, but it also ends up killing 890,000 innocent Chinese civilians. Um, and it also leaves 5 million Chinese homeless or had some sort of damage to their house. Uh, so here's a picture of the streets after the dam blew up. So, I mean, people are rowing their boats in the street. All right, oh, here's a map of the Yellow River, by the way. So you can see it's a major, major river, China. So what are Japan's goals in all of this? So they wanna take over China and all these other Asian countries, but why? Um, four reasons. First reason, they wanted to create a new order in East Asia. Pretty much they wanted to rule it. Two, they wanted to create an industrialized society. Three, they want Soviet Siberia. Why? because they have a lot of natural resources like coal, natural gas, diamonds, gold, and iron. Uh, and they also want to teach Asian countries uh, to be Western modern. Um, so they wanted to, although they're an Eastern country, they wanted to spread like Western ideas to these other Asian countries, which is interesting to think about. So question number two, right in your study guide. Name two of the four goals of Japan regarding invading China. All right, so talk a little bit more. Uh, so Japan, they took the capital of Beijing in 1937. Uh, Britain at that time had a very strong business ties in China, specifically in Beijing, uh, and they saw Japan as a threat. Um, so in 1940, Japan's like, well, guess what? I'm going to invade French Indochina now, which again is, if you see on the map here, so like here's Vietnam, that's part of French Indochina. Here's more of a zoomed in map of it right here. Um, and you can see like in close countries like Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. Yeah. So again, going back to the map here, Japan has all of this land. Crazy. So how did the allies and the Axis powers come to be? You kind of have to think of it as like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Britain and France, they are allies, okay? Both of them have a similar enemy, that's Japan. So Britain and France um, also have the enemy of Germany and Italy. So Germany, Italy, and Japan are all like, wait a minute oh my gosh, we all have something in common. France and Britain hate us. Let's become allies. Uh, so that's what they did. They formed together and they became the Axis powers. So again, uh, Germany, Italy, Japan, they're the Axis powers. Allies would be the Soviet Union, United States, United Kingdom, and France. So, um, yes, the Axis powers, the full name is the Rome, Berlin, Tokyo Axis. Shorten that up, Axis powers. Uh, they agree together to no interfering with expansion plans, um, and they all had the common goal um, of hating those other countries, as well as hating um, communism. Remember, Soviet Union is communist, and also China is communist. So um, Japan really, really wants resources from French Indochina, such as, like I said before, copper, gold, natural gas, iron trees. Uh, the U.S. is mad that Japan attacked French Indochina because France and the United States are also friends. Um, so the U.S. is like, oh, Japan, how bad of you? You totally attacked French Indochina and France is our friend. So I, the United States, am going to put an oil embargo on you. Um, as well as an embargo on metal and other airplanes. Um, and Japan is very angry. Um, so that leads to Pearl Harbor, which happened in December of 1941. So who is running Japan? That's a really good question. So 
The person who's running Japan is, his name was Emperor Hirohito. Here's a picture of him right here during World War II. Uh, here's a picture of him in the 1980s. Um, the emperor is more of a figurehead. He doesn't have a lot of political power. Um, Japan still has an emperor today, by the way. Uh, here he is right here. His name is uh, Emperor Naruhito. They have a very cute dog. Um, the real guy who's calling the shots, his name was Hideki Tojo. This is a picture of him out here. Um, he's really the one that's leading Japan during World War II. All right, again, just another map of all the land that Japan has uh, during World War II and leading up to it. So December 7th, 1941, what do y'all know about Pearl Harbor? Um, so that is when Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Um, they sunk 18 like warships and over 3,500 people uh, died because of it. Uh, today you can still visit it in Hawaii. There's like a memorial. Um, the reason why Japan attacks the United States is because they put an oil embargo on them. Um, and Japan went to war to improve access to oil. It was all about oil. Yes. We've seen that theme a lot through some of the other movies that we've watched in this class. Crazy. Um, so Japan also attacks the Philippines in the British colony of uh, Ma Malaya, which is today known as Malaysia. Uh, they also invade the Dutch East Indies. Um, Dutch East Indies are like down here. You can't quite see it on the map. All right, question number three, right in your study guide. Uh, why did Japan attack the U.S. specifically at Pearl Harbor? Okay, next we're going to talk about uh, World War II in the Pacific Front. Uh, so here's Japan up here. I know the map kind of cuts it off a little bit. Um, but some important places to note include Iwo Jima, which is this tiny little island right here. Uh, the Philippines, uh, which is controlled by the United States at this time. Um, yeah. So first, let's talk about the Philippines. So here's kind of a zoomed in map of the Philippines. Um, so Bataan Peninsula is this little chunk of land that's right here on the island. Uh, so Philippines, um, between January to April of 1942, Japan attacks the Philippines and U.S. forces located here in Bataan. Um, Japan captures 76 thousand prisoner of war that's a lot of people so uh what happens is that the japanese army makes them walk a 60 mile march from one prisoner of war camp to another during this time the japanese armies beat starve shoot and behead any prisoner of wars um and that include and only 54,000 prisoner of wars like made it back or made it to the new camp. So that means over 20,000 people died during the journey from one camp to another. Um, and this is called the Bataan Death March. Um, so here's kind of more of a zoomed in map of it. Um, so they had to go from here all the way up to here. And during that time period, over 20,000 prisoner of wars um, died. All right, next, let's talk about the Battle of Medway. Uh, so here's the US. Here is Hawaii. Um, here is Midway Island. So you can see it's pretty close to the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and then Japan's right here. So Battle of Midway is considered, considered the turning point in the Pacific War during World War II. Um, so the U.S. intercepts Japanese message that they were going to attack U.S. on Midway Island. Um, here's kind of an overhead of the island. I mean, this thing is just teensy tiny little island. Um, here's what the island looks like today, by the way. It's overrun by seagulls, but you can still see the machine guns. Um, so the U.S. gets to Midway first and waits to ambush the Japanese since they intercepted the message. Uh, during this battle, the U.S. destroys for Japanese aircraft carriers. It was a major victory for the United States and is considered the turning point in World War II on the Pacific Front. So something called island hopping was a tactic used by the US and its allies. Um, so Japan is made up of several islands and there are even more islands surrounding Japan. Um, and the goal is to capture islands leading to the mainland. Um, so you can see here in this map, 
Um, so like Pearl Harbor right here is in Hawaii. Uh, so the United States wants to jump, to jump, to jump, to jump, to jump, to jump, to eventually get to Japan. Like they're jumping through all the little islands. Um, so you can kind of think of it like a save checkpoint in a video game, but you know, of course it's real life and very deadly. So again, here's a bigger picture of it. You can see like Pearl Harbor. So the US Navy is gonna jump from island to island to island to island to island to eventually they get to mainland Japan. All right, uh, Iwo Jima, that's another really major battle. Here it is, it's a tiny, tiny little island off of Japan. Um, so this is also a major battle, mostly air battle on this one though, instead of like land or like sea battle. Um, so my question for you is why do you think the U.S. did almost all of the World War II fighting involving Japan? Uh, the reason is, is one, they have the biggest navy. Two, it's only the Pacific Ocean that separates U.S. and Japan. So the allies like Great Britain and France and, well, Soviet Union. But right they're located in europe so they're literally halfway across the world from japan where the united states is a lot closer because all that separates them is the pacific ocean so uh iwo jima is an island off of japan it has a lot of scattered or it's very scattered with caves and crevices um and it had two japanese airfields on it already um so here's a modern day picture you can just see like it's a really hilly really mountainous this island and there's just a bunch of little caves. Very good for hiding. So, um, yeah, if it had a bunch of caves and crevices, what is it good for? It's good for hiding in, um, like soldiers hiding. So the US won this battle of Iwo Jima. Uh, 6,800 Marines were killed, 19,200 were wounded, um, which seems like a lot, but compared to the Japanese, they had 18,500 soldiers dead after this. That's a huge blow to them. Um, Japan had a no surrender policy. So that's why most of them or most of their soldiers died. Um, because instead of like, you know, giving up and going back to the ship or the base, uh, they would have like this mindset of you need to fight until you're dead. Um, so that's why there were so much more like casualties on the Japanese side. Uh, so many Japanese lives are lost in also something called the kamikaze attacks. Uh, most famously, like we talk about kamikaze during Pearl Harbor, uh, but it happened throughout World War II, including on Iwo Jima. Uh, what they are is um, they would be in an airplane and they would like dive bomb like, like the United States Navy ships and stuff like that, um, just hoping for like a massive destruction. Uh, the Japanese uh, Iwo Jima soldiers who did come home alive were very shamed for not fighting to the death. Um, many of them committed seppuku or harakiri, um, which is where, I think I talked about this during the last samurai, but that's where um, like the samurai commits like a ritual suicide and then someone that they trust like cuts off their head. Very interesting. Okay, Okinawa, that's also a major island. Um, so. April 1st, 1945, the U.S. takes over Okinawa. So you can see here on the map, it's pretty darn close to Japan at this time. Okay, U.S. is creeping in really close. Um, and it gave U.S. a military base, and it ser still serves as a U.S. military base today. So here's a modern name picture of one of the U.S. military bases on Okinawa, and they're very famous for their taco rice. Yes, it's taco-like stuff on top of rice. It's a big thing. The atomic bomb, probably one of the most infamous things about World War II. So U.S. President Harry S. Truman dropped two atomic bombs in Japan, okay? First one, Hiroshima. You will see this in the um, in this corner of the world movie that we'll watch. That happened August 6, 1945. Instantly killed 140,000 innocent civilians. Instantly. Nagasaki, that was the second one. August 9th, 1945, that killed 74,000 innocent civilians in a blink of an eye. Here's a picture of the aftermath. So here's a couple that is standing up on one of the towers. You can just see like the fence is totally mangled and just looking out on absolute destruction. 
All right, so here's another picture of Hiroshima. Um, so you can see like there's a couple of like the concrete buildings that are still standing, but everything else is an absolute rubble. Um, another really like horrible side effect of the atomic bombs uh, were the burns that happened on people. So this woman here, uh, she was in Hiroshima. Uh, she was wearing a checkered pattern like um, clothing. Um, and the flash was so bright from the atomic bomb that it actually burned the pattern of her clothes into her skin. Here's another really, really eerie thing that happened during the atomic bomb. Um, so the, the flash of it was so bright that people who are standing here, like this person was standing on the bottom of the steps, it was so bright that it burnt their shadows into the concrete. <laughs> Think of that. It burnt their shadows into the concrete. Today, there are still some sites in Hiroshima um, and Nagasaki that you can still see those shadows. So after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the last lasting impact was that the entire globe lived in fear of being totally annihilated. Everyone was scared of the atomic bomb. So this prompts Japan to surrender. So Japan surrenders to its allies September 2nd, 1945. Uh, they were defeated due to heavy casualties, and of course the bomb was kind of the final straw. Uh, they had no weapons to outdo the atomic bomb, so if the U.S. wanted to drop another one again, they couldn't stop it. Uh, so Japan surrenders on the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. Here's a picture of that right now, or right here in the corner. Um, you can see that like the Japanese diplomats are right here, and then just a bunch of soldiers are lining around um, them, and they just sign a piece of paper saying that they surrender. All right, next we're going to focus on hunger in Japan during World War II because this is another really like big theme in the movie. Um, so, like I said before, Japan had little natural resources, okay? They're like a big rocky volcanic island. There is not a lot of farmland for them either. And what, what it is is very poor soil. Um, so any trade that was cut off from them uh, hurt, hurt the basic needs of the civilians, um, which would cause a huge hunger issue. Uh, so here's kind of like a newspaper clipping of a reporter in World War II talking about how bad hunger was. So it says, it was a sweltering hot day a month before the war's end. A crowd of people had gathered on the street about 100 meters from my house. I had rushed over and saw that a boy had collapsed. Where are you from? Where are your mother and father? He had no strength left to reply to questions from the people around him. All he could do was nod or shake his head, keeping his eyes closed. He was 13 years old. His family had all died in the major March air raid over Tokyo, and he was all alone. Attempting to go to relatives in the countryside, he had come as far as the town of Fukori in Shizuoka Prefecture. He had not eaten for days, and his body was emaciated and had no energy left to walk or open his eyes. Thinking they had to get him to eat something, several women ran home and brought back stewed pumpkin and roasted soybeans and put them in his hand. The boy opened his eyes slightly and seeming to say thank you. He gazed at the people around him. He brought his hand toward his mouth to try to eat the food, but he missed and it fell to the ground. Two hours later, the boy no longer moved. He died of hunger, hunger at age 13. So that's how bad it was. I mean, there were just people dying in the streets of hunger. Um, so what was the Japanese government's solution to this? They literally were like, go send the city kids to the country. Um, so over a million kids were sent to the countryside to live with rural family members. Uh, this was in hopes to easing food shortages in the city. Um, because right the countryside, like there's a lot of wild plants and you have like the farm fields and stuff. Like you would think that would solve the problem. It didn't. So family members sent kids to school, uh, hoping the school would provide them a meal. Um, but schools e didn't have a steady supply of food either. Uh, so for lunch, the teachers would just be like, go outside and find whatever you can. Uh, so they would. They would just go outside and eat whatever they could find. That include things like rhubarb or mugwort, which I think is a fungus, uh, bamboo shoot, freshwater shrimp, frogs, grasshoppers, ground beetles, pigeons, snails, anything they could find. Um, so kids and teens would also turn to thievery. 
Uh, so they would steal food from farmers right out of the fields. Uh, again, it's not because they wanted to, it's just they had to, they had to live. Um, and adults would send those kids to steal the food. food. Um, so they would literally like put their kids on a bus and be like, okay, go to the country, go steal some food and come back. Um, kids were less likely to be arrested. So that's typically why kids did it and not the adults. Um, and city kids would ride the train to the countryside, steal food, and then go back home on the train. Um, so Japanese government also took advantage of the hungry. Um, so they gave people food if they could do experiments on them. Uh, yeah, I know, horrible, right? One of the things that they would do, they would be like, oh, here, I'll give you this food if you go in this like deathly freezing cold water and see how long you can last. Uh, they would also feed them red bean buns filled with typhoid fever, which if you don't know what that is, here's some symptoms on the side, pretty awful. Um, and they did this in order to create a vaccine for typhoid fever. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Allied forces uh, during the course of World War II, they dropped 160,800 tons of bombs on Japanese cities. Uh, so lots of houses were destroyed. Uh, that's where families fled to the countryside in hopes to live with their relatives. Uh, villagers forced by the villagers living in the countryside were forced by the Japanese government to um, like help the city folks take refuge. Um, villagers often treated the refugees very poorly, uh, so they would make them sleep in sheds and then feed them food scraps. So question number four, right in your study guide, uh, give me three details about how hunger was a struggle to the Japanese civilians during World War II. All right, so in this corner of the world, uh, why this movie? Why do we show this movie? Uh, it shows warfare, but it doesn't show warfare on a combat front, right? It shows it on the home front. Like we watched American Sniper, okay? That's like in your face, like you're on the ground, you're seeing the bloodshed, the war going on. This one is more of like, what is happening at home? What are like these women or other people who aren't in the war, what are they doing? Uh, so yes, Japanese military and government did terrible things uh, during the war and other humanitarian crises, uh, but this movie really gives light to the str struggles of the Japanese civilians at home. So this was released in 2016. English version was released in 2017. I show the English version of it. Um, it takes place in Hiroshima and Kure. Kure is the shipbuilding port that's next to Hiroshima. Um, it is not based on like a single true story, uh, but the creator of this used multiple counts of Hiroshima civilians experiences to make like this story. Um, so everything that happens is true. It happened to someone. It just didn't happen to all one person at the same time. Uh, so again, here is a um, map. So here's Hiroshima right here. So Kure is just going to be like a suburb of Hiroshima. Uh, as you watch the movie, towards the end of each of the 30-minute ed puzzles, there's going to be a big question, so make sure you answer the big question on your study guide. Um, after you're done watching In This Corner of the World, which is Lessons 28, 28 until 31, uh, which <laughs> times up perfectly uh, because your winter break is, um, like, we end In This Corner of the World and then winter break starts is, like, perfect. Um, so after you're done watching In This Corner of the World, you have winter break, but I will also open up the week nine folder. That is where your unit three summative is. Um, so over winter break, if you're like, ah, I'm kind of bored, maybe I want to do the unit three summative, do that, okay? I will have that open for you to do. Uh, the unit three summative will be due on, uh, let's see here, that would be what, January 7th is when unit three summative will be due? Yeah. Let me know if you have questions about that. Um, so again, you're gonna watch In This Corner of the World, lessons 28 to 31. Let me know if you have any questions. The Unit 3 Summative is due January 7th at midnight. It's a podcast, so I get to listen to your voices. How exciting. Um, again, let me know if you have questions. Thanks for watching. Bye.